Yeah, good morning, everyone. So today we're going to uh, carry on with our discussion of um, health services and why we're all here for. Um, today's talk is on need, demand, and use. Now, you may think you know all those three words really well. They're not hard, but then actually there's more to it than initial thought. Um, and actually, we're all clinicians here, so actually it'd be really good to to get um, all your perspective at the end as well about the systems in Japan and where you know it, um, countries you know it. So just to outline where we've um, gone thought through so far from the outline of the course, um, one of the structures we use in this course to lay out health services I mentioned um, on Wednesday, as we look at it from inputs, processes, and um, outcomes perspective. So it's a nice structure, and we've already whirlwind through our way <laughs> through our inputs and we talked about formal and lay care, diseases and medical knowledge and um, healthcare professionals as well and um, also users of healthcare and the staff patient interaction and actually um, you know yesterday's seminar we had a little bit more deeper dive about healthcare professionals and the users of healthcare and you can see where it fits in in the sort of grander scheme of um, uh, of health services and delivering health services. Hopefully, we're barely beginning to build a picture already of you know the micro, macro, uh, meso levels of how health services are organised, and come to realise some of the complexities of it. You know, we 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 see it now that it's come to be, um, and and what the challenges we're facing in trying to solve the many questions on quality on if. The, and the different dimensions of quality and we're looking at different aspects of a large puzzle and why it is it is the way it is hopefully we're now getting below the surface a little bit and we're getting a picture so today we're going to carry on with processes and looking at need demand and use so that's where we are okay so we're going to start off with a conceptual model and um, you know, I don't need to teach grandma, you all know what models are. Um, but basically, it's just for us to be mindful that um, it's a model. Um, what we're going to share you know, is what ta what's taught in the course, what's in our, uh, in our textbook. Um, it is a simplification of the realities of the world. But we know that systems um, and organizational health services is complex. And we do require a model to help us explain the complexities of the world. And we're always working with models um, in science and also in our daily lives. Like, for example, we were, we're really familiar with geographical models like a map. If a map is a simplification of, simplification of what the real world is, but you know, without a map, we wouldn't be able to even start understanding and navigating things. So this is similar, and a conceptual model um, simil in, a, in a similar sense. It's helping us to think about processes. So this is uh, a helpful one to look at need, demand, and use for health services. Like I said, you might know all these three words, but it's actually not as obvious as you think. And, but it's also really crucial to lie to the heart of health services delivery, to understand uh, what each of these are, and also the interrelationship between these. So hopefully this morning together, I'll take you through an overview of um, how we can think about each of these and how we can think of it together and the model that relates it all. So I'm going to share with you two models this morning. Um, but the first one is this. Okay, we have a population and this is a group of people in a country um, and if you magnify it, is it could be you or me um, and so we are a population and it can, and if you look in the sort of more micro sense, one of those in the population becomes a patient, um, can be a patient, a member of the public. And at this point, suddenly you wake up this morning and you have a headache uh, because of the summer's heat, you feel headachey. And then at that point, you have moved from the population to a felt need arrow, you have a felt need. You aren't doing anything with your headache, you just feel like you have a headache. It's a subjective thing, you know. No one else knows about your headache and no one else can qualify it. It's just you. So at this point, it's a felt need. Then, 
you do one of two things really. He said, you might turn your felt need into a demand. This is where you go, oh, I think I should check this out. This is odd. I'm not used to having headaches first thing in the morning. And you will go to either your pharmacist or your doctor. <laughs> it might be one of those things. But those things, both of those, you would have moved yourself towards demand and that way. And you've turned your felony into demand. Or you might be a stoic and think, I do not trust doctors. I do not trust painkillers. I don't want to do anything. I'm going to sleep it off. Um, and you'll just be, it will just have gone to the felt need. You will not have done anything with the need. And that would not be demand. So once you've turned, and this we call term illness behavior. And this, whether you do this or not, is purely uh, down to the patient, down to the public. Um, and it's a vital thing. We talked about lay care and formal care. It's a vital thing because this illness behavior drives that cross between uh, turning from lay care into formal care. So this is quite a crucial concept to remember. So felt need to demand. The next step is also very crucial, and that's called turning it from demand to normative need. And this is based on if you turn up to your doctor or your pharmacist um, and you say, I have a headache, doctor. The clinician can want to do, to do one of two things and say, yeah, I think we should check you out. You know, this is, you know, I'm going to look at your, do an optimal, an optimal scope and look at your thumb that and I think, oh, I'm not sure, maybe we'll like scan your head and <laughs> something that we think it's serious here, going, you know, not normal headache. Or I say, oh, you can sleep it off, it's nothing, it's, it's nothing serious, don't worry. That's clinical judgment. And that can turn your need into a normative need, so a need for healthcare, objectively um, concluded by the doctor or the clinician to say, yes, you have a need for formal healthcare. That's not necessarily a doctor's, only a doctor's role. Uh, it could also be um, sometimes the pharmacist decides that, saying, well, yes, I'm going to give you a drug, and uh, you need this medication. Uh, take this and you'll be better. That's also a formal uh, normative need because a clinician has qualified your demand. Sometimes they will say, no, don't worry, take a rest, you'll be fine. And that will um, be a felt need. Now we might think this is clear cut because it's objective, but actually, you know, I will further explain, but actually it's not. It, it's, it varies. It varies, um, you know, sometimes it's very obvious. If you have a broken leg, hopefully 100% of doctors will see your x-ray and say, well, no, that needs fixing, let's reduce it or something. Um, or uh, it might be very subjective. Uh, it might be like, well, yeah, sleep it out and see, you know, two days later, if it's not better, come back. You know, it might be sometimes not obvious. So there's a degree of variation in clinical judgment as well. That's also crucial. Then afterwards, we have uh, a couple of things. Your need, so if the clinician has decided you have a normative need, there's one of two things that occurs. Your need is met immediately where the doctor treats you or the pharmacist gives you a prescription and you um, have your net need have been met, so you're in the most far right. Or there's a bit of, ra this is what we call rationing. It's impossible for all health systems and healthcare services to meet needs, all needs straight away. Um, and uh, for example, uh, waiting lists is a form. So you might, you might not be able to meet your need immediately. You still have a normative need. It's just not fixed immediately. It might be a bit of a wait. Uh, or, yeah, you, you should have a hip replacement. It doesn't look very good. Uh, however, be on this waiting list. And this can be long or short. Sometimes it's not a waiting list. Some rationing happens uh, in healthcare because of pay, your ability to pay. So yeah, you can have this treatment, but you can pay for it. And if you can't pay, also, you are you've gone into category of unmet need, so that's rationing. Now, if you are in unmet need, one of two things can happen: your need can be met at some point, time point in the future, or it can go back to a felt need. It can never be, it can probably never be met, and eventually, you know, your symptoms spontaneously resolve, and you go back into the population, and you don't no, no longer have a health need or a felt need. The last thing. Uh, just to point out also 
that it's, it's possible that you are in a healthy population, and we are a school of public health, so we think about populations, without a felt need. And this is where screening comes in, where you didn't know you had a need, that you, that you actually have disease, and you screened it, did, and, um, you know, health, health uh, prevention activities, you went for screening, and you detected some early cervical cancer, and so you suddenly have a disease and it becomes normatively, normatively straight away without your realization of having a felt need. This is um, the model. Hopefully, you know, it's a way of us understanding you know, the way needs and demand come and use come together. There is another model, um, which is also quite helpful, and this is by an Australian GP. Um, sometimes in the 60s, called the clinical iceberg. It's quite famous in other when you probably have heard of it. Um, so what he kind of clearly you know, described is that there's only the top of the iceberg above the waterline, so, so, so to say, that you can see, which is demand for formal care. And that this iceberg gets bigger in the bottom. So majority of the population of us, hopefully, are healthy. And we have no need, demand, etc., for health care at all. And then, then there's this little chunk of a population where he called it unfelt need. So this is the people who would actually have disease, but you are not aware. So unless they went for screening, they wouldn't know. Then there's another chunk which we covered where there's felt need but no demand. So this is the person with a headache and haven't done anything about the headache. And then we've got demand for lay care, we talked about on Wednesday, where you seek some support and advice from friends and family, and then over the borderline formal care. So this is also quite a classic and useful model. But can you imagine, we talked about on, in, um, on Wednesday, that all that demand for lay care, if that shifted to formal care, how that might shift the waterline and how much more demand for health services that would create. And we talked about changes in lay, provision of lay care as well um, as one of the challenges that we're facing today. Okay, so today we have you know, four topics to consider really. Um, we, we talked about need already, a little bit, professional judgment, use, and does use reflect need? And these are all few, few quite crucial interrelationships. Hopefully our model has started to um, help us think a little bit about where things sit. First of all, we'll talk about need a little bit more. Need for health, just a recap, is a felt need, subjective. And in order to be able to understand it, there's no other way to, to get to it unless, unless we do population self-assessment surveys and a bit of objective measure. Like you can have you can send in clinicians to people's homes to observe people's mobility, for example. Um, or you ask the patient to say, can you report how much you can walk? And often, you know, clinicians take history purely for to get the pe people's assessment of the of um of their health, of the needs for their health. So this is how we, we get evidence from epidemiological surveys. Okay, and a, and the need for healthcare, normative need is all of the above, plus a clinician knowing, this is crucial, knowing the knowledge of the appropriate use of care. So what if, if there is an effective treatment out there? So in places where you know there is no effective treatment, um, you don't know what, what's best to do, then there's no need for healthcare because there's nothing to solve that person's issue. There's also an understanding of cost effectiveness here. So, you know, we might have osteoarthrosis or osteoarthritis and you might see it very obviously in an x-ray and the patient can be reporting symptoms like, I can't walk up the stairs anymore, doctor, and it's not very comfortable, you might get a niggle. And the doctor says, yeah, yeah, you have osteoarthrosis, you have osteoarthritis. But when does that turn into, yes, you should have a, have a hip replacement, I think you should have one now. That's a, you know, risk. Uh, benefit judgment, that's cost effectiveness judgment, that's when, when is treatment better than no treatment? That's crucial. So that's why we say the above plus knowledge of appropriate care. We might think that's black and white, but actually for about 
80% of healthcare, we actually don't know necessarily the cost effectiveness, let alone, not, but we don't know the effectiveness, let alone the cost effectiveness. Mm -hmm. So actually for most of care, it, it's actually dependent on, on a lot of things, time and place, you know, and, and, and clinical judgment, uh, most of all. Um, it, it's also dependent on um, understanding of the best treatments as well, so you know, with new clinical guidelines and things. For example, so high income countries, it varies between countries. So high income countries, it is now um, you know, shown to be most cost effective and effective if you have a heart attack, time of your heart attack to a PCI center within 90 minutes. And that's exactly you know, what, what you want. Uh, so it is most cost effective if you have a heart attack to send them to a major center and get them into a catheterization lab to open up their, uh, their blood vessels again within 90 minutes. Now that's expected in England. Uh, that 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 we, we do that with our EMS services with our patients. Most cost-effective care has been shown best for uh, best for patients um, and best for the health uh, services. However, if I was in rural India, I wouldn't expect that. I wouldn't expect my I shouldn't expect that same level. So it's dependent on how much you spend spend as a health service, uh, system, health service, um, uh, technology. And what is on the understanding of the day in scientific evidence? And what is uh, affordable? And that is uh, dependent on the willingness to pay. Threshold is dependent on, uh, on the value judgment uh, the country puts in on health. So just to be mindful that these things are more complex and have a lot more than, than one needs to buy. So let's move on to some evidence and some studies that show um, this in context. You know, what does it really mean? So this is a really interesting study that shows us um, the uh, decision to screen for a AAA for abdominal aortic aneurysms uh, from America, UK, and US. So now, scientific evidence that underpins when you should screen or whether you should screen for AAA it's the same. So these three countries use the same scientific literature. It's a multi-center country study. And can you see the variation um, in the, how the decisions are made to screen it? So what they have decided to screen for AAA. Same evidence base, but um, for the UK, they decided to only screen men between the age of 65 to 74. And then for Canada, they also decided to screen women above the age of 65. But UK, we don't screen women at all. And in the US, not only do they screen men between 60 to all the way to 85, women as well, and also men. With, so they've decided on quite different things and who to screen and who not to screen based on the same literature resources, uh, literature evidence base. So it reflects what it, you know, the decisions reflect what um, is most cost effective at the time. And now me and you sitting here, we um, can't really decide who's right. Who's to say America is doing it best? Is Canada doing it best? They're doing, you know, well, oh, at least they're doing women too. Or is UK actually most cost effective because the evidence suggests that you should only screen men and actually all those women don't actually really need to be screened. So we, we can uh, assume, but only, you know, we can't really say who's right and what's wrong. Also, it reflects how much the country is willing to spend uh, and the resources they want to put in. Okay. And it's also a very interesting, slightly older study now, but um, they, this group have looked into um, grey literature and policy documents of very different social insurance schemes. So all of these countries have a commonality, France, Switzerland, Germany, Luxembourg, Israel, Lebanon, uh, and having a social insurance, and they provide packages, standard packages of care. And they've looked at what is provided across all these countries, so they have some universal things, then the interesting thing is they've also looked at some controversial tre treatments that only some countries provide and others don't. For example, uh, some countries, so what is what's called controversial? It means that these six countries don't all provide dental care in their standard package of healthcare. So they don't think dental care is necessarily needed in there. But 
we might go, oh, interesting. You know, something uh, dental care should be included, should, should it not be a big debate. Germany, it's the only country that offered spa treatment, spa care. Now, I don't know if uh, in, in Japan, with their spas, I know hot springs are very popular. Uh, spa care, is that in a, is that in a, the spa uh, <laughs> health? Is, should that be provided in a universal uh, package of healthcare entitlement? Uh, but, you know, in England, if we thought about spas, we think about, oh, very luxurious, it's definitely not healthcare. Uh, but in Germany, that was, um, at that time, um, that was provided as part of the insurance scheme. So, you know, whether it should be fundamental entitlement, you know, these are really fixed. And, you know, this is probably a combination of the behavioral beliefs about health, what, what a cultural country context perspective feel that is beneficial to healthcare, um, and the impacts, combination of those. We don't, sitting here, again, we can't really put a judgment on whether it's right or wrong. So, it's quite interesting. There's two other types of need that we should actually be aware of. In the literature, we have uh, something called relative need, which is when we, um, which is when actually a lot of country, countries and a lot of places use a lot because we don't actually know the, the, the need we mentioned, the difficulty in measuring need. We need to use population surveys and incidence and prevalence. So when we don't actually know the true need, we use our relative need, which is comparing with similar populations. And we are making some assumptions. Uh, we are um, you know, uh, uh, trying to understand that one incidence and one prevalence in one population is similar. We also don't know exactly how effective uh, a lot of the treatments are we mentioned. So how cost effective, how effective, maybe only about 20% of interventions, we know definitely that there has been you know, technolo health technology assistance or um, effective uh, cost effectiveness studies. So that's when why plan and planners usually use a relative need. So, oh, my neighboring city is doing this much, is seeing this much need. Yeah, I think that's probably you know the right amount uh, of need. So what we do, what we offer, what we say is need. There's a combination of all these different things, wisdom, experience, belief, cultural, um, there's nothing that's uniform in this. Similarly, um, sometimes some textbooks call um, some say express need, and that essentially is demand or normative need. So they say express need is the demand for help. Okay, another important concept for us to talk about is uh, professional judgment. And we already touched upon it through our conceptual models. But essentially, we know professional judgment varies. Not only does it vary between country, which we've already seen in AAA, uh, decision to screen or not to screen, but it also varies vastly over individuals. So two doctors might not make the same decisions. Uh, we often say, uh, hear doctors say, oh, I don't have the power to make any decisions anymore. The managers make it all. But actually, doctors do make quite key decisions. So the majority of the highest treatment costs, so whether or not you have a hip operation or not, no or hip operation, does lie between the clinical judgment of, of, of the medical profession. Some limitations, but actually, you know, the doctor is the one that decides to give you that uh, hip replacement. But if you do decide to give you a hip replacement, it's $10,000, um, so it's quite a lot. Nurses can also make a decision. If you are a nurse and you decide to give a patient a, a, a very expensive dressing, silver lined dressing, um, and you give all your patients silver dressings to help them have antibacterial benefits, that cost will be so much different, more different uh, than if uh, you decide not to give any silver dressings and just normal, uh, the, uh, the basic dressing. So it can actually have huge impacts. Other things that uh, we know that professionals take to make decisions. We touched on this yesterday in our seminar. Professionals consider three, mainly three aspects. Self-interest, patient's interest, and society's interest. As a clinician, um, not only if you're a doctor or, or a pharmacist, nurse, all clinicians do that in the health setting. 
And when, I, when it's mindful that we should look at self-interest, um, what we call it aspiration for income, enjoyment to work, and desire for approval from peers, I think it's important to consider all three of those aspects. And self-interest is not a negative thing. And only if it's the balance is ticked. It's not a derogatory um, term, and I think that's important to understand. If you had a doctor whose self-interest was so high that it overrides society's interest, overrides patients' interest, that balance, when it goes wrong, can be very detrimental. But usually, when it's in check, there's no, there's no, no issue. As a patient, you obviously want your doctor to be purely in your own interest. But actually, you know, as a as a good doctor, you will probably want all those three things. You want the doctor to be able, not only thinking about the patient from them, but have a bit of perspective of society and the importance of resources used. So you could argue that a good doctor is having those three things in balance. Because we know we know that if you give one thing to a patient, someone else is not happy. That's why a blue streets perspective. And, and, and these things are not, again, not fixed, and that's why there is a variation um, in differences there. So this is quite an interesting piece where um, The Guardian is a newspaper um, from, from, uh, from England, and um, this, this is not a scientific study, but uh, uh, an article um, from journalism. So this is a journalist. Um, he actually went around uh, London one area of London, and sort of investigated journalism and went to um, different, um, he took his mouth basically to four different dental practices. Um, and he just uh, went, went along and said, what can you do for me? And so he went to these four different surgery, said the dental practices, and they quoted him on the same day, these different figures for work he needed for his mouth, his teeth. Uh, can you see that the first one said, ah, oh, it's a routine checkup, 32 pounds, this is some time ago, um, more times than ever. And all the way to the, <laughs> the last one said, uh, you know, it's pretty bad, I think you need a lot of work, Nine, 915 pounds. And that's just one mouth, one day, um, four different services. Look at the variation of what they're offering. You might speculate <laughs> the reasons why, but I mean, from here we don't know the reasons why. We don't know if um, Nigel Mayer is actually being, you know, the right uh, amount, that's the right amount of work he should have done. And um, actually Pickering just didn't want to have the hassle. Or whether or not there's something going on there that actually somewhere in between is the right we, we don't know, but actually it's just interesting, isn't it, to see this variation. Um, so thirdly, use. Now, we can look at use in different ways, different perspectives. Mainly, the measures of use um, uh, are from two, two different uh, perspectives, different ways of accounting um, for, for where the data comes from. Firstly, is population-based, so where the individual population is counted. For example, we can have immunization coverages, emergency missions for asthma, we count the number of people, that's population-based. Service-based is when you know, we look at from one surface or one area, the proportions um, to another. So GP referral rates, uh, proportion of patients from an area admitted to a specialized center. So this is a different perspective we can look at use. So let's look at some examples of this. First of all, this is a surface based um, measure of use. So you look at the different general practitioners from Finland and we're looking at um, how many are referred uh, to um, in per consultation uh, to, to, to a service. And out of a thousand consultations, some GPs make very little uh, referrals to secondary care, and some make way more. This is about a 15-fold variation there. Why is that? Some family, you know, this is generally you know, general practitioners, some um, in, in, in just one country, really, can disease really vary that much? Or is it some that are saying, well, 
are dealing with more of it, more experienced GPs are not referring, more inexperienced GPs are, are referring lots, or is it the other way around? Um, when some are more safe, we don't know if it's good or bad, but it is a 15-fold difference, it's quite dramatic. Though. This is another service-based example, um, where we're looking at districts of you, you, um, the states. Um, and this is about the ratio of using you know, a branded version of drug outside patent or a generic version when the generic version is um, available. And you can see here, there's huge variation, isn't there? But this is probably a bit more obvious if you're looking at it from a healthcare perspective point of view. You probably want people to be using a lot uh, more generic drugs and a lot less uh, patented uh, pay patented expensive drugs, but we can see how you know uh, there's a, le a lot less use of the of generic medicines in the staff in the US. So what's going on there? Yeah, think about pharma, the big pharma we were talking about, the interactions there. Mm, huge, huge folds of variation. Oh, by the way, mindful. This is for Medicare um, in the states. So this is public. They're public over 65 years old, um, those um, drugs. So you know there is a federal interest in, in this because it's public money. So this is a um, different country, looking at England now. This is um, districts in England. And, uh, and uh, how many patients are admitted to a stroke unit rather than a normal ward. And we know for definite that actually for this case, that stroke unit are much better for patients if they have a stroke. So we know good is being in the stroke unit um, and an ordinary ward, not so good for outcomes. And this is a bit based on service based as well because we are looking at districts. Yeah? Um, the PCTs are well, population districts in a sense. Um, so on the way here, some are 100% emitting into a stroke unit, so dark blue ones. And others are, are below 50, below below 50%, around 40%, like right at the other end. That's a huge variation. So we know sometimes some places in some districts, patients are getting 100% of the best benefit. Yeah. Uh, the for right at the end, less than 50% are. This is all within one country, and um, it should be mindful that this is a national health service mechanism in England. Okay, this is some um, you know change for lower income countries, also very interesting, um, and this is like a population based um, use of look uh, look on use. So we can look at a few things here. This is a use of immunization coverage. We can see that again there is huge variations in some countries have no data. The dark grey. But again, you can see that on the population level you have huge variation in use. And uh, population based uh, emergency emission rates to England for asthma. So this is uh, not a referral, just a direct general turn up to us turn up to emergency department for asthma. Huge variations. You know, we can assume the prevalence and uh, there might be some prevalence and variation uh, in asthma in district. But if this is population-based emission, emission rates, um, are we assuming that much of a difference within one country? Mm. Why is that? Okay, so when we're presented with data like that on utilization rates, what can we do? Um, and actually, you know, before we even get into that, it's important to consider a few things. Statistical factors uh, is important to think about when you look at data. Uh, we look at, we, we know that sometimes data is incomplete. Um, and so we always have to question the data. Um, make, check, make sure it's correct. Random variation. Can be statistical differences, chance, uh, bias, confounding, and also, um, so that can explain some of the statistical factors. And so we can actually do something about those. Demand factors, we know that we age, sex, population differences, and morbidity rate. 
illness behavior we talked about. That's fairly hard to account for. And there are also supply factors, the availability of services and of professional judgment. Okay, so when people want to lower variation, there's often a belief that there's a hidden agenda, like, you know, we want to reduce variation to the lowest level because that's the best. Uh, we can reduce costs. But actually, we don't know most of a lot of the cases, um, except you know, stroke units, um, that whether or not the lower end or the higher end is better. For some things, it might be that we should be reducing things to the low, lowest of variation. So, we need to think about different things. And then when, when we are seeing data, we might see that actually, you know, when we want to know if people are reporting data in a way that's fair and, and, um, and, um, and also um, in a way that's transparent. Some places are under-reporting intentionally because they know we want to decrease variation. Also, um, for supply side, uh, we also know that there are differences in, so when there's availability of services, it's pretty standard, we can measure that very easily. Um, we know that um, you know, the professional judgment varies a lot between countries we've seen. How do we find out and adjust for these things? We just need to know, we, we, we need to know that actually, for demand factors, that there are some things that can be accounted for. But things like illness behavior and professional judgment is actually very impossible to capture. And a, a combination of things that we might need epidemiological studies uh, and that routine data won't be able to uh, help us answer all those questions. Okay, so this is an interesting um, figure and statistics from uh, America just to show us um, the sort of variation we're talking about in terms of professional judgment. I think this is a good um, example uh, of, of the variation in, in services and use and, um, and, uh, and what's offered. So we've got things that are very low variations, very nicely um, presented. Um, hip fracture repair, that's reassuring, isn't it? Because you, your hip is either fractured or not fractured. Um, and you hope that all fractured hips will be repaired. Um, so that's very low variation. Uh, this is a, you know, each of the line is a region in the, in the state or a district. All the way to the other end, a radical prostatomy. Look at that variation. Um, that's huge. Uh, that's, um, I don't know from here, there's hugely divergent views as whether or not. And, um, and we don't know which of the district you want to be in if you have prostate cancer. Is it that you don't have a radical prostatectomy? Or is it that lots are referred for radical prostatectomy? Somewhere in the middle is things like hip replacement. Back surgery, bit of variation, um, but it's impossible to say. Uh, but it's very um, nice, nicely uh, shown. So, what are we all thinking about now? The most key important thing is: does use reflect need, and how do the, those two relationships work? You know, we see use, we see evidence of variation in use. We know that those different elements of need. How do those two fit up? Fit, and um, this is probably what we're really after. You know, probably in many countries, use probably doesn't reflect need, uh, but it, but it's how much it differs we want to know. Seeing this huge variation, and then this is a GP in New South Wales, Julian Hart, Tudor Hart, um, in the 1970s, and he wrote um, this is really quite neat. Um, in areas with the most sickness and death, general practitioners have more work, larger lists, less hospital support. They inherit more clinically ineffective traditions of consultations than the wealthiest areas. And hospital doctors shoulder heavier caseloads with less staff and equipment, more obsolete buildings, and suffer a uh, recurrent crisis in the availability of beds and replacement of staff. These trends can be summed up as an inverse care law, he quoted in. And, said. Um, and that the availability of good medical care tends to vary inversely with the need for population served. So, 
what he's saying here, and it's probably similar in your country and even today, we can see that the burden, uh, the sick who need more care should have more care, but actually have the least. And but, but, but the opposite is true. Uh, the wealthiest who need less care may have the best uh, access and um, use and also the best care for them. How widespread is this wonder? You know, let's consider a couple of things. Birth, at age, at birth, and elderly may have higher levels of need. And look at social economic status, because we know poor, poor may have higher levels of need. So these things we know. And let's have a look at the data. So this is a health expenditure for women um, in, in Netherlands, in, uh, in Holland. And, and then they followed up on women um, throughout. And, and they, they look at this, and then you look at this, and you go, oh, it looks about right. Age zero, you need healthcare. Um, quite a little, because uh, we know at birth, you know, neonatal, intensive care, etc. You need some. The first year of life, you may have childhood infections, and you need care. And towards the latter, and you know, this this looks like it seems to reflect need. Then we have social economic status uh, from another study and the use of healthcare. Health visits to healthcare professional in the past two weeks by social status. So the top social class is one and two, and then all the way to the uh, most deprived, um, social class five, we see that actually the most deprived have a higher visit and a higher uh, visit to hospital and higher visit to health professionals. This also looks like um, it seems to, direction seems to reflect need. Porous, more hospitalization. This is GP referral rates. Uh, per 1,000 people of a population. And let's look at this. The least deprived have less referrals, and most deprived have most, more referrals. This also shows us that actually use looks like it is a, um, reflecting need. Poorer, most deprived, have more referrals. But you, we, we must also want to ask ourselves, is this gradient steep enough? We know it's going in the right direction. But should it be even steeper? Should it be much lower for the least deprived or much higher for the most deprived? We don't know. Is it, is it reflecting me well? <coughs> to do that, we have to consider one more thing. The use-need ratio. It's necessary for us to consider uh, the use to need to access whether, to think about whether or not this um, higher utilization rates reflect a higher level sufficiently. Okay. So it's, it's difficult to under, know true need. We, we can use a surrogate and proxy measure of need. And then we want to compare that with different groups of using the same service. And then we also need to measure the demand side factors like morbidity and illness behavior. So this is use need ratio. Now this is interesting, understanding a proxy measure of need. Because we don't know the true need for uh, coronary vascularization um, and the true need of coronary heart disease, we, um, this is a study that's done uh, for my school at LSHTM some time ago. They looked at different districts of um, like, uh, UK a referral for uh, coronary heart, back then there's cabbage, so a coronary heart bypass, um, bypass surgery for people who have a cardiovascular disease. And we don't know necessarily the true the need um, of um, cardiovascular disease in all the districts of England, but they have used the proxy measure of need using the SMR, standardized mortality ratio. So on the bottom line, we've got a standardized mortality ratio. And you know, we know that if it's uh, above 100, uh, um, you know, the higher is worse, um, which suggests a higher level of need from deaths. And um, we've got on the top here the rates of uh, cabbage. And we can see that actually uh, there is an inverse care law here. That uh, in, in England, the districts with the lowest level of surgery um, have the highest SMR rates. Okay? So, there, so here, uh, use is not reflecting need, okay? and where need is uh, measured by proxy. And this is in England. Um, which is very, you know, it, might, it was surprising when this was found. This is a system based on process equity 
um, like we can see the inverse care law working here. Those who um, have the lowest level of surgery have the highest level of need. This is also interesting. This is from problems data. So in England, um, we do patient reported outcomes for hip and knee. And um, they have found that those with them who are most deprived socioeconomically, um, in the 20% in the uh, most deprived in the population, have most severe, more severe symptoms. The odds ratio, uh, sorry, not, that's not odds. That's, they have um, 3.6 points less than their score for severity. Um, so they're more severe, more severe um, than um, those who are more, um, more uh, well, uh, have higher social economic status. So they were in greater pain, had greater symptoms at the point when they had surgery. We don't know anything about those people who didn't access healthcare. This is just at the point when they had their hip, hip replacement. And also those people who are most and more deprived have 11% more likely to have a longer history of symptoms than those who are least, less deprived. And these are statistically significant. This is also uh, another showing measure, measures of type 2 diabetes and different um, processes of process by deprivation. And we can see that actually um, the line, the trend is, is on the <clears throat> Okay, when we look at measuring demand side factors, this paper is very interesting as they've um, tried and attempted um, in, uh, Canadian, by Canadian researchers to look at um, not only um, morbidity but illness behavior. And this was a first, it's so hard to measure illness behavior. So they took two areas of, in Ontario, which is one of the provinces in Canada, um, and they measured low use and high use areas. They have uh, looked at objective data as well, so they looked at their, examined them, x-rayed them, um, and looked at you know, the, the need in the population way as best as they could. So they found that actually in the low use area, there was a population of um, 26,000 versus high use area, then severity of arthritis does vary. So they did find that high use uh, of hip and knee replacement areas have more severe arthritis than low use. So that trend uh, um, works. But they also did the survey, which is the extra bit of trying to understand illness behavior, is asking them, do you want a hip and re replacement surgery in their survey? And they also interestingly found that high use areas also want more surgery than low use areas. We thought we knew about uh, variation in need, variation in disease prevalence, but what we didn't might, didn't know before this study is you know measuring illness behavior is how the variation changes and how much people want surgery. And this is within one country, um, one province, um, and actually there's differences between how much people want surgery. Sometimes we might be crit criticizing for iniqu iniquity. We're saying, oh look, there's such a huge variation in use, such a huge variation. But actually, what we didn't, what we don't know normally is how much there's a variation in illness behavior and demand for that. Sometimes there might be a good explanation for a difference. People just don't want surgery. You know, we are assuming that uh, these people are given good, uh, informed decisions and making the the the, the right. Uh, informed decisions for the treatment choice, um, there is differences. Okay, well, went through all that, and hopefully that was a, giving you an overview. Thank you very much.